Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Edie, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> you guys know that this woman over here is crazy. <laughs> Anyhow, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I want to thank the committee uh, and Harlan and, and Zan and Wendy, and I want to really uh, thank Paul for the, uh, the very safe drive here. I was here a few years ago, and... Uh, it's such a great story, i got to tell it again. Uh, is Cheryl here? No? Cheryl's not here. Oh, that's too bad. And my friend Kip, you know, you know, Kip told me this morning as I was leaving breakfast, he goes, well, just remember, they stand in judgment. <laughs> you know, and I've been up since 4 o'clock. I walked on the beach because, you know, I've been awake. And, uh, you know, I, the, the talk that I may give may never get given, but I've given a lot already. Because I'm a crazy alcoholic. But let me tell you about the alcoholic who picked me up in Portland a couple of years ago. Her name's Cheryl. God bless Cheryl. Because you know when, you know, uh, when you agree to do these things, sometimes you just don't ask enough questions. Right? And when you get off the plane and, and you get your bags, there's always surprises. You get little surprises. And my little surprise was, Cheryl and her do, and her two standard poodles in her Mustang. Uh, they didn't look like standard poodles, actually. As I was walking up to the Mustang, they looked like Shetland ponies. Uh, I, I kid you not. Uh, you could have put a, a saddle on them, and Kip's kids could have taken pictures of these dogs. One was sitting in the front seat, and I looked down, and, you know, the Mustang's not very big. You know, Mustang's kind of small. And I looked down, and... Uh, she looks at me and she says, well, do you want him to get in the back? <laughs> well, I don't want to occur like a princess. <laughs> but it's, is, I said, well, isn't it a long drive? And she says, yeah, it's a couple hours. And I said, well, yeah, I, I would probably like for him to get in the back. And she says, she looks at me and she says, well, do you have issue with animals? <laughs> and I looked at her and said, and if I did, because we're up a creek. At any rate, uh, <laughs> uh, that's that. <laughs> and she, and you know what? She drove the, I've lost my glasses already. Oh, here they are. She drove that Mustang like a Mario Andretti, and me and the dogs had us a raucous good time, and Cheryl likes to make eye contact when she talks. <laughs> and, the dog, and the dogs get real excited, and they sort of slobber, so every once in a while they just reach up and give me a lick, right? So uh, <laughs> I always remember my experience coming to Seaside. Uh, uh, first of all, what I want to do is I, I think I've thanked everybody. If I haven't, I thank you all again. This is an incredible privilege to be here with you. And now what I would like to know is because I am always so privileged to meet the new people. So I don't want to embarrass any of you, but if there's anybody in their first year of recovery, would you mind standing up? I want to thank you for doing that, and I welcome you here. You got some really big, this is a big deal. And, you know, I'm going to read something, and the reason I read to people that are new, if you're new in your recovery, is because when I got here, I couldn't read. And I have something that is actually Tim AA approved, and it's from the grapevine. And I'm going to uh, read it because I can, because Harlan doesn't have a hook. Anyhow, it's about the AA Fellowship, and the reason I read this is because I really think it speaks to what's going to take place here this weekend, and I hope I can read it without crying, but probably not. 
started crying early on the beach this morning. I thought, oh, it's going to be one of those days. Thank God it's early and I can just get it over with and enjoy the rest of the weekend. (laughs) The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA is a spirit. It cannot be touched, nor can it be completely understood. It is as wide as a world, yet small enough to fit snugly in the hearts and minds of men and women. It has brought light where only darkness dwelled. It has given hope to the hopeless. And is, oh, it's already starting, isn't it? You know, my, you can't see it up here, but my butt is just literally in convulsions. You know, I know that's a good sign because any minute God's going to kick in here. And it's going to be spiritual by God, but it's, uh, and I have those controlled panties on too. Uh, you get to be my age, you know, you use all you can get. Anyhow, whew, whew, the power of recovery. It has brought light where only darkness dwelled. It has given hope to the hopeless and help to those who only yearned to despair. It has nourished and it has nourished forgiveness in those who knew no forgiveness, and it has given strength to the weak and humility to the strong. It has spurred to higher goals those who strive for nothing. It has taught patience to the hurried and action to the lazy, to youth it has given vision and to the aged promise. To the sick it has been a doctor, and in the dying it has revived the will to live. It has no judgment against the unteachable, nor has it praise for those who learn. To the childless it has given children, to the ignorant wisdom, and to the wise tolerance. It is given to all men and women, that which is most precious. It has given love of truth with enough left over to share with each other. Uh, I just love that because I think, isn't that kind of cool? And if you're new, I'm going to really talk to you because I really believe that my talk is more geared towards you because a lot of what was said in the second paragraph is true about me. I came from... uh, I come, I came from that kind of family they talk about in big book, the big book, Seeking Lower Companionship. Uh, you know, we never had that Buick and track home. <laughs> and then sort of progressed. You know, when, when I woke up and came to, you know, when you have those first memories, we was always in just a beat up old car behind some beat up old bar. They had already gotten there. So to say that when I got to you, I was a little wounded. I, when I was brand new, they said I was just full of hate. <laughs> I was a little hostile. Uh, I had my first drink. I think if you're an alcoholic uh, of my type, you remember your first drink, and I think that you learn to mimic the people you grow up with. Uh, the people that I grew up with carried the bottle underneath the seat. They didn't drink uh, cocktails and glasses with ice cubes. They pulled out that bottle. They cranked off the lid. They took a big swig, and they always went, Ugh. I thought it was just a Mexican thing. Uh, and, you know, and I don't know why uh, I can remember this, but I think I remember it because of the fact that it was just a really powerful memory. And you remember that first drink you ever had? And, you know, and I don't know why I made the decision, but I reached under the seat and I pulled out that bottle of Seagram 7 and it had, like, that much in it. And I did just like, the, like I mimicked. I did exactly what, they, what I'd seen him do. I cranked off that lid, and I kicked that whiskey bottle back, and I took the biggest gulp of whiskey I had, and it came out of my ears, out of my nose. You know you know how whiskey is. It just goes, and I just went, ah! So I knew what the groaning was about, right? <laughs> but pretty soon, the magic came. Pretty soon, the magic came, because I felt that whiskey go all the way down into my belly and go spread out, and then it just went, wow. You know, that warm wah. And you think, I found it. Now, you know, I'm like uh, nine, eight, nine years old. But you know what I found out at that young age? If you can find some whiskey, it'll take that feeling of hunger away. And, you know, uh, I'm always, always grateful to be, it's such a privilege to be able to share at a meeting. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm from, I'm the kind of, family, to say that we're from the wrong side of the tracks is an understatement. 
You know, by the time I was 10 years old, I could tell by looking at your tattoos where you did time. Uh, you could, because I grew up in that culture. I grew up in the culture where it, when you lived in low-income housing, you could tell by the people that walked across the court whether they were hookers or social workers or parole agents. Because that's what you learned to do in the environment that you learned to survive in. And I was in an environment where you straight up needed to survive. You know, my mother was a, a crazy, crazy Indian woman. Her name was Henrietta. She's known for a lot of things in a little town called Hollister, California. One of them being that she was uh, the first woman. She, there's this, she uh, rode Indian motorcycles in Harley. She was not a traditional woman. Uh, she did, definitely could fit into the category as soon as you told her she couldn't, she had to. Uh, her daughter's just like her. Uh, but what I want you to know is my mother uh, never made it to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. She, she never got that gift. And it took me so long to really get what a gift it is. My mother killed her madness and her pain uh, by walking down the hall, sitting down on the edge of the bed and taking the gun and shooting and killing herself. And that's how she quieted her madness. I was three and a half years old, and I found her. So to think that I got here with a little attitude, and you, you know, as this goes on, you're going to see that God has done great work with me. I could be a poster child for Alcoholics Anonymous. I kid you not. Um, and I get present. You know, I was walking on the beach, and I'm thinking, so, so, what you going to tell them? You're going to tell them something. <laughs> you know, I'm not one of the, the reason they have me at 10 o'clock. There's a reason. It's structured. Harlem's afraid that I might disappoint him at Saturday or Friday, so that's why they got Kip and the big hitters. Because, you know, I have a tendency to get off track. <laughs> they, they don't want you to be off track on Friday or Saturday night, let me tell you. But I'm going to stay on track as soon as I get on track. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you one thing. What we're going to have this morning is going to be real. It's going to be real. And uh, as I was walking on the beach, you know, the sun came up. And, the, and uh, there are these rocks on the beach. And where the tide comes in and the tide goes out, around each rock, it forms like this really cute little sculpture, depending on how big the rock is. And as I was walking, I'm like, well, that's really who we are in Alcoholics Anonymous. We're we're uniquely different, but yet uniquely the same. But we make our own pattern and footprint in the world and in our recovery. And if you're new, what I want you to do is know that whatever I have to say up here, it's just my opinion and and I'm 48 years old and straight up opinionated. Oh, I need to give my sobriety date. Uh, you know, I thought it was so great the way you got You know, they do that in Texas, don't they? They do. So I'm going to do it, just like they do it in Texas. I'm sober, July the 11th, 1983. My home group... <laughs> uh, thank, you. thank you. My home group is group three, and my unit meeting is Sunday morning uh, spiritual, Sunday morning 10 o'clock spiritual meeting. Uh, so I got, I was going to do that in the beginning, but I got off track. Uh, where was I? I was uh, talking about something. This is why I'm your Sunday morning speaker. <laughs> it drives them crazy. Tim said, yeah, I knew this is why they put her on Sunday morning. Oh, no, I'm not Sunday morning. It's Friday morning. It's Friday morning. I think it's the craziest thing that you have a, a Friday morning, Sunday, at 10 o'clock, a 10 o'clock meeting. It's, it feels like you get your days all screwed up, but this thing is so big, you just got to start off on Friday after Thursday's potluck. My God, I'm surprised you didn't start last night. <laughs> at any rate, I'm, I'm one of those kind of drunks that uh, I love to drink in those bars that uh, you can smell a couple of blocks away. You know those kind of bars that have like peanut shells on the floor and you know, you go in there and, and, and you start drinking and, you know, there, I love the ones with the pickled pig's feet and the Slim Jims, you know, about 10 o'clock you can have dinner, you know, and there's nothing like being about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night sucking on a pickled pig's feet with Merle Haggard on the jukebox, I'm always on a mountain when I fall, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know those times and you just look across the bar and you're brand new friends and life doesn't get any more perfect than that. 
and that was my life. You know, I, uh, I, uh, I grew up with the kind of alcoholics that, uh, we got a call. <laughs> Hope it's important. Are you, are you an ER doctor? <laughs> what we did in life before cell phones. My God, we got a lot to say. But you know, I mean, I remember the first time anybody had a cell phone. It was a big deal. It showed that you had a lot of money. But now anybody can have one. Uh, and I'll need to get off of that. <laughs> it's just when a cell phone goes off, you lose your track. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I'm having a good time. Uh, and Paul's just sitting here, just, just grinning. He goes, yeah, I heard your tape. That's why we put you at Friday. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, at any rate, oh, my God, I am having a tough, you know what? I'm having a tough time. I really am. I've got a lot. I started crying. I've had a... Uh, you know, I think I'm going to tell you about what's going on. I'll get that out of the way. And if I get that out of the way, I'll be able to be with you. Okay? Because I'm going to tell you something. I think Kip said it. He says, honey, what's happening? You look so different from the last time I seen you because I've got all this gray hair and I've lost a bunch of weight. And I said, you know, Kip, man, I've had probably the toughest two years of my life. The toughest two years of my life. Last year in February... On the ninth day of February, I had this eye punctured out, and uh, thank God for technology. I have a, I have a fake lens, and I only lost 30% of my sight. And two weeks later, my one of my foster mothers. I grew up in foster care, and one of my dearest, one of my foster mothers that I loved deeply, passed away. And I had some stuff go on at work that, you know, I just, you know, when you just have life get all over you. And that's what happened. Life just got kind of all over me. And I, I kept going to meetings, kept doing the deal. And, you know, this is the first time I've spoke in a while. So to be honest with you, it's been tough. So I just want to thank you for letting me share that. Now I'll get on with the rest of this. Because if you're new, what I want you to know is life happens to you no matter what. You know, great things have come to pass in my life. I mean, extraordinary things have come to pass in my life. I've, I've had success that is absolutely unbelievable. I have blessings that are absolutely unbelievable. In the middle of all that, things happen. And that's where you get to apply the principles of the program. And that's what's taken place in the last couple of years. And so I'm kind of coming out of that. Life's pretty good right now. I'm in the best place that I've ever been. And uh, and I made it. And I didn't drink. And I didn't use. And you know what? I lived in my home group. I, you know, I canceled some of the things that I had planned for speaking because, you know, sometimes you carry the message and sometimes you just carry the mess. And I decided I just needed to be at home for a while. So I'm here with you, and it's a great privilege, and I know that sooner or later, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so I'm in these sleazy little bars, drinking in these sleazy little bars, you know, and I, I was one of those people when it talked about the ignorant. I really got that, because when I first got to you, I thought that I was ignorant. I really thought I was ignorant. I was in high school in this little town of Chowchilla. Uh, you know Chowchilla. That's where they took the kids and buried them in the bus. Remember, do you remember that? Well, it doesn't matter. It's a little, it's a little town. I grew up predominantly in the Bay Area. I, I lived in San Francisco down in the Fillmore. I panhandled in the streets of San Francisco. I sold the, Sada the Haight Ashbury news. I got it. You need it. You buy it. You read it. I was a survivor. You know, my, the woman that I lived with after my mom died was a cousin. And I want you to know that uh, she was in the chronic stages of alcoholism. And she took my hand and she took my little brother's hand and she took us to the place that little kids shouldn't go. We've seen things we shouldn't have seen. We had things done to us that shouldn't have been done to us. And, you know, I want you to know that, that uh, thank God for Al-Anon. You know, I'm coming up on 20 years clean and sober, and I've been in Al-Anon for nine years, and I'm thinking, what took me so long to get there? What took me so long to get there? 
You know, I was uh, I was a little kid that you know Mary had a drinking problem. You know, Mary had a lot of problems. You know, she fa- she, but she was a festive gal. Uh, she considered herself a a call girl. A call girl is a little bit more than a whore, uh, but she showed up predominantly like a whore. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, when she should have charged, she didn't, and when she shouldn't have, she did. So she spent a lot of time in the in jail. So I spent a lot of times in holding homes with my little brother, and uh, because of that, I had a lot of life experiences really young. And what happened to me is I grew up probably a little too fast, faster than I should have. And uh, but I learned a lot about surviving. I can tell you one thing: I'm a risk taker. And uh, you know, this woman. To tell you the, the level of her alcoholism and what she was like, she started out in, in, the, in the Bay Area, and she liked sailors. Predominantly, she preferred sailors. But she ended up in Watsonville, which is a, is a place, it's a farming community, and she was doing the labor camps. We lived in a Mexican, uh, we lived in a room above a Mexican bar. We had a, we had a box springs with a, with a blanket and artichoke crates for furniture. And it was in that place where her alcoholism, you know, she was all bloated and distended. And in the morning, I would give her that Red Mountain wine, you know, that Carlo Rossi Red Mountain wine, and one of those little shrimp cocktail glasses. And, uh, you know, you eat the shrimp, and then you get a glass. It's like two for one. And it it used to take about three of those glasses in the morning to get the sick off her. You know, she was in the chronic stage of alcoholism. And what I want you to know is that uh, she died in that hotel room. Her esophagus ruptured, and she bled to death, and she was 33. She was 33 years old. So for me to think that I could have been an alcoholic, see, you know, when I got to you, I had some stuff. You know, so it was really hard for me, because in my mind's eye as a little girl, I got a picture of what a woman alcoholic looks like, and that wasn't me. So I had a really challenging time. I guess you could consider me, I was considered a retread in Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1979. Uh, my baby brother called me. He'd gotten out of the uh, VA hospital in San Francisco, and he says, you know, Edie, I got nowhere to go, and I was wondering if you'd let me come and live with you. And I said, well, sure. And he goes, well, you know, they make me go to AA meetings, and uh, I'm on antabuse, but in order to get into AA, they ha- you have to have a blood member take you. I don't know what the rules of AA are. I'm like, well, I think that's a damn good rule. Don't you? My brother is very bright. Uh, I went to my first meeting in, in December. I think it was around December of 1979. <coughs> and uh, I didn't drink much beer. I wanted to be respectful of those people. You know, you know, I'd been around alcoholics. I knew, you know. You know, I don't know about you, but you know how you first go to meetings and you, you, you don't want to, oh, maybe some do, but I was one of those that didn't want to ask any questions. Uh, I kind of make up stuff as I go because I'm fairly intuitive. <laughs> you know, like you go in and you read all the, the little signs, thinking, you know, you know, you know, you read it and you get it. Okay. <laughs> then, you know, then they sit around the sign-in sheet, you know, that sign-in sheet. Well, I, because I grew up in welfare and foster care, and we'd been allocated food through the you know, foster care, you know, you get them, you get so many cans of pork contingent on how many foster kids are in the house. So within five minutes of being in the meeting, I figured out why you signed your name, because you had to turn that form into somebody that would you, give you some coffee. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Now, now, doesn't it make sense to anybody else? It, I just made that up. Figured that was the truth, so when it came to me, I signed my name, Edith Francis Cartwright, because I didn't want the social worker to think that I was one of you. Now, all that I did in the first seven minutes of being in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, it's called being really self-centered, you know, thinking you're too important, and none of it was true. So you got to watch it in the first year or so, because we have a tendency, well, I shouldn't say we, but stick to I, I made up stuff. So I signed in like that, you know, my full name. I did everything but give them a little blood. And who do you think they called on first? Well, you know, that that chairperson said, well, I'd like to talk to, let's hear from that Edith Francis Cartwright. (laughs) And we want to hear from her. And I looked over at them and said, I want you to know 
that this is my brother, and I am a blood relative. <laughs> you know how they give you that look? Oh boy, we got a we got a live one tonight. We got a hot one with us, you know. And the old the old one started. Oh, well, are you taking that one, or I'm taking that one, you know, and. Uh, And of course, I proceeded to tell him all about my brother. <laughs> Somebody that night talked about blackouts, and I thought, oh, I hate that. They said only alcoholics have blackouts. You know, when I was in high school in Chowchilla, Mr. Welk took me into his office. You know how they uh, they prepare you for Harvard? They need to do preparational classes so that you can get accepted to Stanford or Harvard. But Mr. Welk, he had these little glasses hanging over his nose, you know, and he looked at my record, and he looked at me, and he looked at my record, and he looked at me, and then he said, well, you know, Edie, gosh, with an IQ as low as this, I don't know how you got, how you didn't get upstairs with the retards. And I thought, well, I always knew I was stupid. I just didn't know it was that bad. And so I said, well, how bad is it? And he goes, well, you do, you know, gosh, Edie, I'm almost... I just don't know how to even tell you how. It's pretty bad. He goes, you're never going to get into college. He goes, but you're handy with your hands and you're, you're a track star, so we'll just keep you in general population. But, honey, you got an IQ of 83. And I'm, well, I don't know what the hell that means. I said, well, is 83 bad? And he looked over at me. She said, well, honey, people with eight, uh, IQ as low as 83 have trouble holding spit in their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we get here with a lot of misinformation. <laughs> and I looked at Mr. Welk and I said, well, what am I going to do? And he goes, well, I don't know. He said, well, hell, you probably could, you can't spell, can you? And I said, no, not really very well. And he goes, well, you can't even get a job as a waitress at the Red Top. He goes, but you're handy with your hands. You know, there, there's a big push right now for women in, in, in trade. You should do that because you're handy with your hands. So, you know, when I got out of high school, I'm handy with my hands and I can't spell. So I joined the Carpenters Union. I'm handy. I didn't do it because I was blazing any trail. I just did it because Mr. Welk told me I was too stupid to even be a waitress. You know, I went back for my 25th uh, reunion. God has a sense of humor. And I've been very successful in life because of Alcoholics Anonymous and a loving God, so I got to drive up my Jaguar. <laughs> and you know, I was, <laughs> and I was dressed because, you know, when I, in my first year, early years of recovery, I thought it was all about that. You know, if you had the right car and all of that. And what you get in recovery is you get all that, and that ain't it either. But, you know, Mr. Welk walked up to me, and because I've had so many foster families in Chowchilla, and, you know, they love me so much, do you know what they do? They go to Save Mart and brag on me. Well, you know, she's in that A&A, &A, and she's doing real good. And, oh, she works at the Uni University of California at Davis, and, my God, she's got a big-shot job. And they just don't, you know, they just because they're so proud. You know, and Mr. Welk walked up to me at the reunion. I want you to know that both his kids, one, the daughter, I don't know if she's ever going to make it get clean. From, they're, they're strung out on crank, and the one son's been in the penitentiary. And he walked up to me, and he said, you know, on, I've heard such great things about what has occurred in your life. I feel bad about that day. And I looked at him, and I said, you know, Mr. Welk, hell, I think in all actuality, you help me out. And I said, you know what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is our past becomes our greatest asset. And it was it was predominantly what you had said and a couple of social workers had said to me that I was driven. I was driven to do something with my life. And he goes, well, you know what? We're all so proud of you. And I said, thanks. That means a lot to me. And I said, and if you ever get a time where your kids think that they're, they need it, and I gave them my telephone number, and I said, you have them call me, and I'll drive down here and take them to a meeting. And I want you to know that that's how recovery has shown up in my life. For, it says right here that we are given forgiveness for those who could not forgive. 
And that's how recovery has showed up in my life. I've learned how to become a human being in recovery. And I got here, I was so wounded when I got to here. And I was so angry. And I was so full of hate. You know, that they, I could, I could hardly be in the room with you. <laughs> and you either would hardly be with me. I was a piece of work. But you know, you're, as you stay here, and if you're blessed to stay here, no matter what, you just keep coming back here. Incredible things happen. You know, the first woman that I, 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 I was a retread, you know, uh, you know, you come a little while and, you know, and you get, you get, yeah, <laughs> something happens and there you are. Well, I know what happens now, but there you are. You know, and I, I used to drink at AA and old sleazy bars. Then, you know, one of my last drunks, I love this story. I love this story. Because you know how those old ladies and younger ladies, and all people, but when I, it seemed like when I first got here, everybody seemed really old. You know how they just seemed really old. And they used to say to me, Honey, you can quit drinking any time. You don't have to go out and gather those yet. And I didn't know what, you know. You say, oh, yeah, ha, 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 ha. And then you go on and, you know, one of my last drunks was in the wagon wheel in Witten, California. I was drinking uh, Coors Light because I thought that would prevent uh, blackouts. It's not really alcohol, it's something, but, you know. But sure enough, you get to be in the stage of alcoholism that I'm in, and, you know, it doesn't matter, two Coors Lights and you go bye-bye. You just go bye-bye. And I woke up. I woke up with the ugliest man driving my car you'd ever seen in your life. I mean, he wasn't just ugly. No, I'm sorry. Uh, it was the ugliest, ugliest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Uh, it was in the, it was like August. It was hot in the Central Valley. It gets way into the hundreds, 105. So it was hot. He had on his summer outfit. Uh, his summer outfit was a t-shirt that didn't quite fit over his belly. His belly was sitting on his thighs. He had on a Levi jacket with a, with a, the, uh, arms cut out, bad tattoos, county, a lot of county tattoos. He had a red bandana around his head, and I looked over at him and thought, my God, I bet he's one of those yets. <laughs> you know, you don't know what the hell a yet is, but by God, that's got to be close. <laughs> and that's when you do that, you know, you do that, you know, if you're a woman, you kind of do that body thing, thing, oh, I wonder we've had any activity. And there was movement in the back seat, and we had company. You, you know how that is when you've been on one of them, you know, you're on one of those, and you kind of come to, and, oh, there's more than two. That's good. And there was a woman in the back seat. She had on a pink boob tube or tube top or whatever they called them in the late 70s. I don't know what they call you know. With a Hales Angel wing coming out the top. You, you know, one of those. I looked around, and I looked at them, and I said, so... Where are we going? <laughs> you, you know how you have that? Well, you might as well chalk up, you know, spark some conversation here. And figure Maybe we can figure out where you pick these people up. You know, like, okay, let's just kind of... And they informed me. <laughs> you know those are, you know, it's like, oh, my God. They informed me we were going to Reno to buy some drugs with my money. <laughs> You know, then you, you, these are the kind of people you don't look at and say, well, I've changed my mind. <laughs> you don't. But you think about the, what, the, what they've been telling you in AA. Well, there'll be days like today. <laughs> these are yet. These are the things that if you keep drinking, these things are going to happen to you over and over again. And it gets worse. You know, that's how they talk to you. And I thought to myself, you know what? I could pull out all those chips I got in my glove compartment. Because <laughs> I had a lot of them. I had, I had enough chips if you drilled holes that it might have a concho belt to go around me twice. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you, if you're, if you're one of those, please don't stop coming. Please don't stop coming. Because some of us, it takes more. It takes more for us to let you in. It just takes more. You know, I thought I could pull out those chips and say, you see all these? <laughs> People in AA told me there'd be days like today. 
<laughs> I'm in the chronic stages of alcoholism. You ought to take me home. <laughs> you know, make up something. But you need to do something. So with my keen alcoholic mind, I thought, well, well, you got yourself into this little predicament. Maybe what you ought to do is just go drink all you can drink and, you know, just do it till you're done. And then you need to call those ladies in AA and say, okay, I'm done. So I went on a run. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know how long it lasted, but I came to and I was in a house on, the, on a couch in a nice home, actually a fairly nice home, because God's always taking good care of me. God always looked after me. And I, I and I, I, I woke up and I started walking around. There wasn't anybody home. There wasn't anybody home in this house. I thought, well, I guess they have jobs. And there was trash liners in the trash can. So I'm, you know, upper middle class. You know, I didn't grow up in an environment where they oh, you're going to Safeway? Could you pick up some of them scented trash liners? <laughs> yeah. We didn't do that in my house, right? And there was hot coffee on the coffee pot. It looked like a pretty nice place. And I thought, my God. You know, i got to stop doing this. And in the top of my Wranglers, when I got to you, I wore Wrangler jeans and flannel shirts and, and cowboy boots and two six-packs of beer and forget you. And that wasn't forget you, but it is an AA meeting. Uh, I had a bad attitude. Every other word was the F word. Uh, I was not a festive one that people would want to even go do a 12-step on after they knew who I was. But I called this lady... Her name was Mary S., and she lived in Turlock. And I didn't even know what city I was in, and I called her up, and I said, you know, I guess it, you must be close because, I, you know, it's a, it's a local call. And, she, and I said, this is Edie. You remember me? And she goes, oh, honey, how are you doing? I said, well, man, I'm having a bad day. I'm having a bad day. <laughs> and she says, well, where are you? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I'm in a nice house. <laughs> And she said, well, can you find some mail? And so I, I'm like, mail? Okay, I'll find some. And so, you know, I found a TV guide, and I read off, I read the, I was in Tully Avenue, and, uh, you know, I, and she goes, Tully, that's not far from me. And I gave her the address, and, she, and I can tell you that I don't remember her coming and picking me up, but she took, she came and she got me. And she took me to a detox facility at a place called Scenic General Hospital in Modesto, California. And she put me in a detox ward, and the name of the detox ward is Reality. So when I woke up in my Stanislaus County pajamas, I was in Reality. And I always, I love that story because I think God has always had a great sense of humor in my life. But you know, I came to, uh, with these Stanislaus County pajamas, and I looked on the couch, and there was an old guy with like three teeth. And he was watching almost half of a TV. You know when you have that moment of clarity? Like, I looked down, I had on this robe, and I thought, well, my God, somebody's overreacted again. <laughs> my goodness gracious, this is, like, this is a hospital or something. And look at that guy. My God, he looks like a wino. I'm a dope fiend. I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> Yeah, it took me a while to, you know, the truth of the matter is I don't talk about that in recovery because I'm an alcoholic, but I'll tell you, that white stuff kind of sped me up getting here, and from where I came from, you remember the story about Mary, it was a lot better to be a dope fiend than it was an alcoholic, so I, I, ha I, was, I was torn, but I knew that this was a place that they kept alcoholics. I looked over at this guy, he was, he was rolling a cigarette, you know, with those three teeth and spitting on the paper too much, and... I looked over at him and I said, well, where are we? He looked over at me and he said, you're in detox. <laughs> you know, like, Christ. <laughs> well, I work for San Jose Steel. I have Blue Shield Health Insurance. God almighty, I can get a better facility. They're going to put me someplace. Can't they put me someplace with people with teeth? You know, you know how the grandiosity just takes over. All of a sudden, you know, one minute you're in somebody's house you don't know, the next minute, my God, I can get better facilities than this. You know, that's a, that's the way an alcoholic is, just like that, you know. And so I stood up and I, I put my robe together, you know, that somebody had burnt holes in. You know how you try to pull it together as best you can. You're going to go talk to the officials. Somebody in charge, by God. You know. 
I got off the couch and I walk over and there's this guy sitting in. I knock on the door and he buzzes me in. That ought to be a clue. <laughs> and I go tell this guy my tale of woe. I say, you know, there's been a grave mistake. And I proceed to tell him how come it's been a grave mistake. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, honey, I'm going to tell you something. You've been with us for three days and it's not been pretty. I want you to know that we've had to use medication on you for your convulsions and the things that have gone on. I would think that what you need to know is that you are an alcoholic and that your dance card is punched. And I can give you your clothes and you can go back out there in it. He goes, but you know what I really request of you is that you stay in our 28-day program and give it a shot. Because, honey, you don't have many left. And I don't know why that was any different, but I could hear him because I knew. And in my heart of hearts, the last thing I wanted to do was to die like Mary. So, you know, I left that, that little office and I went into the area where they have the showers and I pulled this old torn up shower curtain back and I got on my knees and I said, you know, I never prayed to you because I never felt like you dealt me anything. But I just asked you to help me do this deal because I don't want to die like Mary. I don't want to die like Mary. And, you know, I went through the 28-day program, and after 48 days, they said, you know, Edie, you got to (laughs) go. You know how when you surrender, you think, again, I just fried potatoes. I don't want to go out there in it, you know, because it takes so much. It takes so much to do the lying, cheating, and stealing, the disappointing of your families and your friends, you know. And I tell you, I was just kind of wore out, and I thought, just let me stay here. But, you know, I went out into the real world, and I used to go to this place called First Street Fellowship. I like to go to those fellowships where on the other side of town because I always felt better there. And this place, there's a man there that saved my life. His name was Earl. You know, First Street Fellowship was a great big hall about as big as this stage, maybe a little, and it was corrugated metal on the top and on the walls. It had three heaters coming down the middle of the room. It had couches, old beat-up couches and tables where they played pinochle and poker, and on the other side is where they had the meeting hall, and in the back they had a little dingy kitchen. And what I would do when I got off work, I would just go, sometimes I, I, I was too afraid to even go home and clean up. I'd just go to that meeting, and I'd sit on those couches. I didn't go to their little meetings. I around the tables. I'd just go sit on those couches. You know those kind of couches that somebody donated so when you sit down in them, somebody ought to pull you out of them? You know those kind? And this guy Earl used to look at me. He had this little chihuahua dog with long toenails. And he'd look over at me and he'd say, there's a meeting over in the corner. And i think, what does he think, I'm blind? Now, I never said anything back to him because, you know, I was what they call kind of a damaged goods. And I don't know how long we did that but we did it a few weeks and he looked at me and he leaned over and he said well if you're not going to go to the meeting how about you go in the kitchen and wash some cups and I thought well I can do that I'm getting kind of bored just sitting here anyhow right and I went into the kitchen it was a you know a dreary little kitchen and there were all these white mugs you know those big white mugs that have chips on them if you're a guy like Tim your finger doesn't fit in them well, you're a big guy, you know, and you love attention. <laughs> Anyhow, I took those bugs and I got some bleach and I got some uh, uh, scrubbers and I scrubbed them. And then I went and got me some contact paper and I painted the shelves. And, and you know, I put those bugs up there. And even to this day, when I go home to Modesto, they, they have this thing because what I would do is, I would go hang, I'd go stand by the tables and I would, if I didn't see you touch your cup or there wasn't any steam on it, I'd just go over and get your cup. And I'd go wash it. I was not a well girl. Okay? So now when I, when I go back to Modesto, they say, they, they say guard your cup because Edie's coming, right? But what happened is I became, you know, I became the best cup washer that uh, First Street Fellowship ever had. And by having that, part of service, I was able, I was able to become a part of, and pretty soon I was able to sit at the table, and uh, I was able to start to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was through that, being with Earl and being there, and you know, we had, we had been loaded up and took over to Modesto in a van, a group of us got together, and 
Well, I heard this woman in San Jose speak. Her name was Grady O. And she was the first woman I'd ever heard say the F word with passion. And I thought, well, I bet she could be my sponsor. <laughs> the only problem is she lived in Sacramento, so I moved. <laughs> I moved to Sacramento so she could be my sponsor. And uh, so I, I hunted her down. God, there's a lot of activity in this room. I'm not going to take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> They're just everywhere around him. Now <laughs> let's have a break. Um, <laughs> at any rate, I, you know, I found, I found, I found Grady. I found Grady, and she was in this meeting. I moved to Sacramento so she could be my sponsor, and I hunted her down. And I said, you know, I heard you speak in San Jose, and you're the first woman that ever said the F word with passion. So I moved here so you could sponsor me. Oh my God! She looked at me. You know how they get that concerned look, like, oh, play Misty for me. <laughs> We get the crazy ones. <laughs> I'm almost done here. It's 11 o'clock. I got the thing. We can't stop. Uh, see, I got up. What time did I get up here? 10 after? Doesn't matter. I'm going to get done in just a minute. Where, where is what's his name? Harlan. Harlan. Remember, he gave, he gave Kip and I a speech. You can't go over 80 minutes. You can't go over. I don't care what you say. You just got to get it done in 80 minutes. I'm thinking, I don't think I can even talk 80 minutes. It, you know, it hasn't been, it's not been 80 minutes. My God. Whatever you do, we got stuff to do here, and you can't go over 80 minutes. And I'm like, <laughs> you gotta love Harlan. Where's Harlan at? You gotta love him. Oh, hey, Harlan. How how long? Has it? It's been uh, 62 seconds. Uh, oh, y'all, it's, I got 25 minutes left, so I'm good. Good to go. Now I'll tell you about the graces of uh. Oh, the, you are all just tucked over there, aren't you? <laughs> Hiding back there. Well, I got off track again. <laughs> God, don't you hate that? Circuit speakers don't do that. Shit, they stay on track. Kip never loses track. Uh, <laughs> where am I? Sacramento. I'm in Sacramento. Great. Thank you. My home group is primary purpose. <laughs> don't you love uh, 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 audience participation? You can tell that this isn't, you know, it's it's all as new to me as is you. <laughs> I'm so glad another 15 minutes. I am done. And I'm just going to enjoy this conference. God. At any rate, I start the road to recovery. You know, and I got there. I still had a car. It wasn't registered and insured, but it ran. <laughs> So I was given the job of going and getting all the girls and picking them up and taking them to meetings. And, uh, you know, I started learning about recovery. But, you know, I don't know about any of you, but I lied when I first got there. You know that liar, cheat, and thief thing? Well, I was a liar, cheat, and a thief. It took me a while to get, you know, you know. So when I told Grady I'd moved there, you know, she, she put her leg up on it and she looked over like this and she says, well, how long sober are you? You know, they, they say it like, if you don't have time, they ain't going to take you, you know, because I make up stuff, right? So I looked at her and I said, well, I got six months. Now, I don't, I didn't have six months, but I thought six months was not a bad lie. You know, it's kind of, you know, you, know, you judge your lies. I must have had six weeks or, you know, six days, but six months, you know, it's not like six years or it's better than 60 days. You know, this is how I think. Well, you know what happens at PPG when they add? So in another six months, what do you think they did? Well, they give me a cake. <laughs> Celebrate my birthday. Oh, you know, there's nothing worse than being an alcoholic lying about your recovery and then making a big deal about it. God almighty. <laughs> you know, you, they claim you got a year. Oh, my God, she finally made it. Oh. Gosh, you got, and then they, you know, it was a podium participation. They want you to get up there and talk about your year. Oh, God, I hate that. I got up there and I said, well, I haven't done a thing to earn this. <laughs> 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 There's a woman that she's got, she's passed away now. Her name was Alabama. She said, well, I'll be honest with you. As soon as I can get it past me. <laughs> I thought, thank God I kept listening to that tape. Oh. Oh, you just listen to those tapes because, you know, they help. So what happened is uh, I felt bad. I felt real bad. 
and I uh, I felt bad, but I didn't want to lose their love, you know. And but I couldn't stand to be with them because you know when you lie and then people are all like nice to you, then you feel awful. You just it's just a bad place to be. And so what happened is on uh, July the 10th, I went back out. I went back out, and that that time I went back out, it was bad. You know, I ended up at the UC Davis Medical Center. Uh, it was a pathetic. I, by now, I don't have any medical insurance because you know, the longer you do this deal and you don't do it right, and you you lose a lot of things. I lost a lot of things: jobs, health insurance, all that kind of stuff. And I was in the medical uh, at the detox, uh, not the detox, as at the emergency room, and they had you know IVs in my arms and hoses up. My, it was a, it was a it was a bad a bad scene. You know how it gets bad and. They're poking you and treating you like somebody who has no insurance. That's the worst. You know, they got tape all over and you got puke all over you. And, you know, my adopted sister had taken me there and the doctor looks down at me and says, so, uh, what happened? And I looked at the doctor and said, well, I just had me a bad batch of potato salad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll get it past, I'll tell you the truth as soon as I can get it past me. You know, it takes us a while to, you know, my, my adopted sister Liz was at the end of the gurney. Ah, oh, she's an addict, alcoholic, retread in AA. Can't get some of her lies about her recovery. She just says, I'm going to Al Anon because they say she's going to die. <laughs> I'm like, my God, is she such a drama queen. <laughs> Don't you hate that? Your family gets all rigorous in front of God and everybody like, Jesus. God, you got to be so messy about it. And the doctor looks over at me and he says, "So, uh, you got a problem with drugs and alcohol?" And I, and I, I, I said, "Yes, absolutely, yes, I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> You've been around recovery for a lot of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. were you allergic to any drugs? <laughs> I looked at him and she's glaring at me, right? And I said, "Well, you just don't want to give me any more anything I want, Mike. You don't want to give me anything I might want some more of, because <laughs> there isn't going to be enough." And the next day, I went to my home group and I came clean. And from that day to this, I haven't had nothing. I haven't had nothing. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's been an incredible journey. I used to hang out in a lot of my, and my home group today is group three. We have a lot of meetings, like uh, sometimes four or six meetings a day. It's a big group. Uh, we're a very strong group. We're very active, and we have a, a great noon meetings. I used to hang out at noon meetings in group three with a lot of potential. Had a lot of potential. Uh, I was going to go do something. I, I, I fancy myself self-employed. Uh, that's what you do when you're unemployable. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm self-employed. Uh, I'm creative. I just can't work. Uh, and there was a guy there who was an architect, and he says, you know, Edie, the state of California is hiring uh, hiring people. You know, with your background, you could probably go get a job. And, you know, and I, uh, you know, with, with Grady, my first sponsor, and she got me into some uh, programs where I got to, uh, because in my fourth step with Grady, I acknowledged how difficult, you know, I could read and write, but not read and write very well. Because, you know, when you're committed to the fact that you're stupid, you kind of show up in the world like you're stupid. Because, you know, it's just easier to be stupid than to have any goals. <laughs> well, I just can't. I'm stupid. Right? And then if you're here long enough, you realize that, you know, alcoholics are highly native intelligent. And I'm not as stupid as I want to be, you know. Uh, because sometimes being stupid keeps you from doing what you ought to be doing, called, you know, what God intended for you to do. At any rate, uh, it was women in recovery, you know, uh, the the older, wiser women who actually embraced me, my sponsor, and uh, there was a whole, it seemed like a clan of us, like wherever my sponsor went to talk, there was 40 of us that went, and we helped each other, and I got this application, and they said, well, honey, we'll help you fill it out, and they helped me fill it out, and this is thing called chronological list of where you, where have you ever worked, you know, like, I never put it down, and, you know, they did all that for me, and, uh, I got this letter from the state saying, show up on this day to take a test to go to work for the state. And I'm 
So you know when you get these kind of letters when you're, you know, in your first, for me it was the first five years. <laughs> you take that to the meeting <laughs> and you give it to the women because they read it and then they didn't tell you what you're supposed to do. You know, they interpret for you. I had to have my life interpreted. <laughs> And they said, well, Edie, you got to go down and take this test. And I said, oh, okay. That's, they said, we'll be there to pick you up. And so they came to my house, and they picked me up, and they took me to the convention center in Sacramento, downtown Sacramento. And they put me out of the car and made sure that I went through the door. And it was a four, it was a four-hour test, and at the end of four hours, they come up and told me, your time's up. But you know what happened for me is I didn't think that I passed the test, but a lot of what's happened for me in my recovery is just completing the process. No matter what my mind may tell me, I suit up and I show up and I go just give them the best sober woman I am today. And, uh, and from where I've come, it's a lot of that is just doing that. Reaching, you know, it's like there's a little thing that my niece gave me. It says, uh, shoot for the mel- shoot for the moon and settle in the stars somewhere. And, uh, and I love my nieces. I mean, I adore my nieces. You know, some of the best, uh, stories I have about recovery is, uh, having to do with my nieces. I don't have any children of my own. And I was there when my nieces were born. It's Taylor and Jordan. They're, they're twins. And they spent, they lived with me from the time they was 18 months old until they were about five. And so on Saturdays, I used to go to Home Depot with Auntie. And then we would go to, we would go to uh, McDonald's to get McDonald's meals, right? And they were like three years old. And we had just got done at Home Depot. And we were going to McDonald's. And they were both strapped in my, in my truck. And I looked over and I said, well, who loves you more than anybody in the whole wide world? And Jordan put her head in, in my my stomach, and she le- she hugged me, and she says, "Well, you do, Auntie." And then Taylor looked over and and, and kind of cocked her head, and she says, "Why, everybody, Auntie?" And I thought, "My God, what a blessing that she's less than four years old, and she thinks that everybody loves her." You know, I'm, I, I was pushing forty-two and wondering if anybody loved me besides them. <laughs> you know, you, you know, it's just uh, I don't know. You get it, or you don't get it. At any rate. Uh, at any rate, I, you know, after I took that test and I completed that process, I, you know, I got this letter. <laughs> I got a letter. I actually was in the top 10% of, of the 700 people that took the test, and I was the first woman ever hired to do an, to hire to do industrial inspection for the for the state architect's office in Sacramento. And I. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know, and, and am I bragging? I'm bragging because I'm talking to the new people. You know, I'm talking to you. It says right here about your goals and your ambitions. Don't, don't for a minute stop yourself. And don't let anybody in AA tell you what you can or can't do because it doesn't, you're not sure that they haven't compromised their goals. You know, I went to work for the state and I was down in San Diego at the Otay Mesa prison. I was there for almost two years and I came home to share at an AA, uh, an AA deal and there was an ad in a paper, uh, about a job at UC Davis. And I thought, well, I'd rather be at home around my, where my, where my foundation and recovery started. And I went to those same women and they helped me and this time I sent it off and got a resume by somebody professional because you learn how to do these things. You know, you get the tools, right? And I applied for this job, and they sent me a letter saying that I had an interview. And I never had an interview in my whole life. Never had an interview in my whole life. And I interviewed for this job with five people, and uh, they asked me all kinds of questions. You know, I got the six-page job, job description in about 20 minutes before I arrived. You know how you read the job description, and you look at it, and you think, well, I can't do this job. <laughs> my God. Eight million dollar budget. I can't even check, keep track of my own money, let alone eight million dollars. I'm like, well, God has a sense of humor here. And I thought, well, you know what? You're already dressed. Just go in and let God do the rest. Just give him the best person you are today and, and just complete the process. So that's what I did. I went in and I interviewed and I looked him straight in the eye and I told him the truth and I left. And I never thought in a million years that I'd get that job, but I felt good about completing the process. And I got called four weeks later. I'd already forgot, right? And they called me and told me that I got the job. And I went to work at the same place that I had my last drunk. You know, when I was strapped down on the table and I had all those IVs in me and I was telling them I had bad potato salad. I work at UC Davis. 
you know, I, that's where I work today, and I've been there since 1987. And uh, uh, it's been a blessing in my life. I mean, God, you guys don't clap. I'm, uh, it, it is a great thing. When I told you I could be a poster child for Alcoholics Anonymous, it's the truth. And about five years ago, there was this big job that came up. You know one of those kind of big jobs that you know that you're never going to get, but, you know, it's like a game. Just start playing the game. Shoot for it and go, go participate and so what? If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. If you do life like that, let me tell you things. Extraordinary things will come to pass. If you stay in recovery, if you sponsor people. I go to four meetings a week. I'm very involved in my home group. We do things together. We play basketball, baseball. We go to campouts. We do all of that. Uh, you know, Paul was asking me about, has there ever been a time where I got uh, away or didn't want to go to meetings? And, you know, and I think about it not really because I knew that I couldn't get very far away. I'm one of those that just can't get very far. There's times that I'd rather stay home and watch CSI, and I know when I start thinking like that, i got to go to the meetings, you know. At any rate, I went for this job that I didn't think I'd ever get, but I thought, you know, I'd like to practice. Let's practice and and, and pretend that we're going to be more than we can be. And I applied for this job as a superintendent. I never thought I'd get the job because it's one of those kind of jobs, right? When I went to interview, when I went to the interview, there was this big long table where you can see the reflection of the people in the table, one of those big wood long tables, you know. And they asked a lot of... uh, Adult questions. <laughs> you know, adult questions. And I asked, and I answered them, you know, the best I could. And at the end, they asked me a question. And, and I thought, well, this is going to put the hamper on me getting this job, but I don't care. They looked at me and they said, you know, if, you get, if you're the successful candidate in this position, you're going to work a lot with the inter- and interact with academics. Could you tell us something that you do in your community that makes a difference where you give back? Well, you know, I look at all them uptight kind of people and thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to tell them I'm an H&I and I'll go to San Quentin and do AA meetings and, you know, uh, sure. I looked at him and I thanked him. I, I, <laughs> I looked at him and I said, well, I'm going to answer your question, but first I'm going to thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a proud member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if it weren't for my involvement in Alcoholics Anonymous, I wouldn't even be here. And uh, and they said, well, what do you do in Alcoholics? And now they're getting, and I figure, you know, what do I have to lose now? I can just relax. <laughs> <laughs> so I told them about H&I work, and they wanted to know, well, what is H&I? And I said, well, you know, you, like if you go to San Quentin or Folsom Prison, because those are both really close to Sacramento, you know, you, you take the meeting in. And, and they said, well, is that scary? And I said, well, it's kind of scary, especially when you sign the non-disclaimer, meaning that if they want to keep you, they won't barter for you. Whoa, they, they, you, know, you know, for these kind of people, that's kind of, really? And I said, yeah. I said, well, my sponsor told me it's the difference between the people that are committed and the people that aren't. And I said, it's kind of like looking at ham and eggs, you know. One was committed and one was involved. And they just, like, busted up, right? Because, <laughs> you know, these uptight people want to not be so uptight, but, you know, you got to spur them on a little, right? And so I, I felt really relaxed because I was just myself with them. I was just really genuinely and authentic myself with them. And I gave them the best sober woman I was that day. And, do you know, seven weeks later, I got the job. So if you are new in recovery... You know, and I don't know what your goals are or what your objectives and what you're looking for if you have dreams, but I want you to know that this is a place that they come to pass. You know, I was at a, I'm American Indian and uh, I was at an, we have our, we have a conference. It's predominantly, it's put on by American Indians and I was, instead of having marathon meetings, they have a talking circle and a talking circle, once you start, you don't ever get to leave. It, it's really, you have to be committed. You don't get to go to pee or anything. And, uh, there was a guy there that was uh, 90 years old and 15 years sober, and he was leading the talking circle. And, you know, he had this most beautiful face with those dark, dark wrinkles, you know, in the darkness. And he, he said, you know, as youngsters, he referred to us as youngsters. He says, as young people, you know, you want to, uh, you want to go to faraway pa- places, and you want to, you know, see all these these." places other than your home and you know uh he said when i was young 
He goes, as an American Indian, you know, we have really, we're really challenged because it's only been in the last like 20 years. And that was been probably 10. So it's been like 30 years, but this is like 10 years ago. He said that we, that our, all, our culture is finding recovery. And, and the, and the, and the firewater has had tremendous impact on our culture. He says, you know, when I was a little boy, there was a, uh, there was a medicine man that used to carry all these rocks. And I always knew those ma- rocks were magical and had powers. So when I was old enough to speak to the medicine man, I walked up to the medicine man and I asked him, where do I get the magical rocks, the healing rocks? And the medicine man put his arm around him and he pulled him close and he said, well, son, I'm just moving that mountain one rock at a time. And he says, that's what we do in, in AA. It says we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives were unmanageable. And some days we just, I can't move my rock and you help me. And then there are days that I help you move your rock. And he says to young people, you go to those faraway places and you, but when you're there, pick up the soil and smell the soil and look at the vegetation. He goes, because I want you to know the longest journey you will ever take will be from your mind to your heart. And I want to thank you because I've been able to take that journey with you today. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.